You know, you referred to the start, and that was uh, the MMDR uh, Act, the I Know Mines closed straight after that dumping from China. What I'm trying to understand here is when you took charge, did you have a priority list or did, did, did it just keep evolving based on the circumstances that you found yourself in? You know, there were always long-term goals that we'd set ourselves, but there were uh, short-term crises that we had to deal with. You know, the long-term goal that we'd set ourselves even then, I think 2015, 14, if you go back to the early days, we had actually said we should uh, uh, chase 30 million tons of steel production in India by 2030. And at that time, that looked very far away. You know, we were maybe at 9 million tons or something like that. So, but we, I mean, it was more like saying that, okay, 30 million tons by 2030 sounds good. And so let's chase that. We knew that we had to grow in India because, you know, where Tata Steel was at that point in time was uh, structurally the strongest part of the business, which is the India business was the smallest. And uh, so how could we grow the structurally strongest part of the business, scale that up, uh, you know, because the India business generates cash every year. It's a 20% EBITDA margin business in a bad year and a 40% EBITDA margin business in a good year, you know, and uh, that was uh, at that point in time, you know, less than 30% of uh, our footprint. So we said we should scale up in India as uh, we go addressing the problems that we have overseas. Even overseas, the challenge was more in UK. Netherlands was always a cash positive, EBITDA positive business. So, so we looked at it from that perspective. And I'm happy to say that today the India business is 60%, 65% of our footprint. And if we realize our ambitions on growth in India, it'll become 80 to 90% of our footprint, which uh, makes Tata Steel structurally a much stronger company than it was 10 years back. You know, expansion on the one hand, yet you've had your eye on the company's debt. When COVID hit over one lakh crore, you managed to cut it by 50,000 crore. Uh, you got a target of cutting debt by at least a billion dollars every year. I'm trying to understand how do you reconcile both those thoughts? One is expansion and the other is cutting down debt. You know, they seem like contrary forces. You know, uh, Mami, this depends on where are you expanding, right? If you're expanding the cash generating assets, uh, you will generate more cash, right? So we are largely invested in growing the India assets. So if India assets, uh, which were at 8 million tons or 9 million tons 10 years back is today at 21 million tons and is at 40 million tons. The cash that you generate is huge. So you refer to the highest ever profit. Last year's profit after tax was 40,000 crores and EBITDA was 62,000 crores on a consolidated basis. We couldn't have been anywhere close to that if the India business was not at where it was, right? So in the past, when we had good years, you could not deliver that kind of cash because you didn't have the scale uh, that you had in India. So I think growing India, growing the scale in India, because India is a fully integrated operation. You know, we do the mining, which is not so visible because most of that mining feeds our steel plants. We have an end-to-end -end value chain from mining to very value-added downstream products. So, you know, like I said, in a typical year, you generate enough cash to more than take care of your capex. So that's why we feel as the size of the India business grows, our ability to spend uh, more capex grows and which means we grow and particularly if you grow in India then it's a bit of a self-fulfilling kind of uh, journey. The subtext of that is that Europe is still a challenge. Um, could it have bottomed out? Is it tough to predict? Could there be a sharp uptake? I'm trying to get a sense of where Europe in particular the United Kingdom uh, fits in. Yeah so if you look at our overseas assets the Southeast Asian assets which are in Singapore and Thailand were largely self-sufficient. They did not uh, require any support from India. They took care of their own needs. Uh, so they were not really having an issue. Or we didn't have an issue with the Southeast Asian assets. Of course, we got out of match deal uh, because we had a good offer. But if you look at Europe, again, we want to split it between Netherlands and UK. The Netherlands side has always been cash positive, EBITDA positive, never needed any support uh, from India and can stand on its own. Uh, that visibility was probably not there for everyone because we were always reporting Tata Steel Europe as a consolidated basis. We still are. But we've already, from a business point of view, split the business. Today, we run Tata Steel Netherlands separate from Tata Steel UK and have done away in some sense with the corporate level of Tata Steel Europe. UK is where the challenge is because structurally, it's a weaker asset. And we've done a lot of restructuring when we acquired Chorus. UK was 10 million tons. Uh, today's 3 million tons. And a lot of it was done over the last 10, 12 years, or maybe uh, maybe since 2010. Uh, so today we have one site in major site in UK and downstream units. The downstream units are still, uh, in some sense, in decent shape. 
But uh, the upstream site in Port Talbot is old, uh, needs uh, uh, some capital investment because the assets are coming to end of life. The cash flows of the business don't uh, support those investments. And hence a conversation with the government that if there's support from the government, we can uh, change to a different process route which makes greener steel. So that's a conversation going on with the government. That site cannot uh, be sustained at this uh, at the current level of operation. So there needs to be something which needs to be done.